Good evening. On behalf of Engineers Australia, I'm delighted to welcome you all to our Infrastructure Thought Leaders series, The Future of Precast Concrete Construction. My name is Amanda Rogers and I will be your host for this evening. Firstly, in keeping with our tradition, Engineers Australia acknowledges the traditional owners of the land and recognises their continuing connection to land, waters and community. We pay our respects to their cultures and to elders, past, present and emerging. Before we get started, I'd like to acknowledge that tonight's webinar is being hosted with Engineers Australia's long-standing industry partner, Austral Precast. Austral Precast is a leading provider of high quality and innovative customised precast concrete product solutions. Operating from plants located across Australia, using state-of-the-art technology, production techniques and systems, the company produces a diversified range of customised products and specific precast solutions. Austral Precast services a range of markets, including multi-residential, commercial, industrial, community and civil sectors. Build smarter with Austral Precast, Australia's largest manufacturer of high quality and customizable precast concrete solutions. At Austral Precast, concrete and steel are merged with reliability, quality, speed, precision, innovation, and creativity. We are the new wave in building. We're paving the way on how high density residential, industrial, commercial, and major civil and infrastructure projects are designed and delivered. At the core of this innovation is our multi-million dollar investment in state-of-the-art facilities at our Wetherill Park plant. This is inclusive of automated robotic machinery, enabling speed, capacity, quality, and the elimination of human error. Shuttering robot and mesh machinery automate critical stages of the production process. This is backed up by Austral Precast's expert team with people and machinery working in close collaboration and where the emphasis is always on quality and safety. Fit for Purpose panels are manufactured to specific needs and requirements. Panels that are born from an idea and constructed to ensure quality and precision, allowing for fast and simple installation on site. We're producing market leading products like Double Wall, Austral Precast's concrete panel permanent formwork system combining the quality and efficiency advantages of precast manufacture with the engineering benefits of in-situ construction. Form and function, reliability and durability, creativity and adaptability, style and beauty. Build smarter with Austral Precast. And now I'd like to welcome our speaker for tonight, Robert Aldrich. Robert joins us as a National Precast Specialist in the Technology Engineering Knowledge Division at John Holland Group, and has been working in the precast concrete industry for over 40 years. Robert brings his expertise to projects and working with bid teams within GHG. Robert has a comprehensive knowledge of most forms of precast, including architectural panels, including polished, patterned, coloured or form. Civil products, retaining walls, box culverts, public domain furniture, structural components, external loading bearing facades, reinforced and pre-stressed beam slabs, columns, hollow core flooring and walling, trans floor, shear walls, insulated walls, stairs, plats, balustrades and 3D products. Robert's recent projects include the Sydney Football Stadium redevelopment, the Coliseum at Ruta Hill RSL, the North West Metro Sydney, and the Westgate Tunnel, Melbourne. Please join me in welcome Robert Aldridge. Uh, thanks, Amanda, for that um, introduction. Um, my name is uh, Robert Aldrich. I work for the John Holland Group. I'm the National Precast Specialist 
and I work in the Division of Technology, Engineering and Knowledge. And I advise on all precast aspects of precast with existing projects, as well as advising on Tim at, on um, bid and tender uh, teams as well for pricing. So tonight we'd like to talk about the future of precast concrete in construction. Uh, and we'll be following the, uh, the agenda for tonight will be one, I'll be talking about the general principles of precast concrete. What is precast concrete? the advantages of using precast concrete components and systems. Uh, the second um, topic will be on designing with precast, which will be um, talking about the fundamental design basics of precast for designers. Um, the third topic will be sustainability of precast, what makes precast sustainable and uh, what, what are manufacturers doing about producing uh, sustainable precast. Four, I'll be covering two case studies that John Horn have uh, built. Um, one is the Sydney Football Stadium redevelopment, and the other one is the Clarence Correctional Centre in Grafton. And finally, uh, topic five will be the future of precast concrete and with innovation and emerging trends. So, first of all, the general principles of a precast concrete. Precast concrete is concrete omelettes that are produced off site in reusable moulds. Precast concrete is cured in a stringently controlled environment within a purpose-built manufacturing facility. Precast concrete is then transported to the construction site and then installed in their in-service positions. Okay, precast concrete excels in strength, sustainability, functionality and durability, has a high degree of quality control, integrates easily with other construction systems, meets the multi-hazard requirements and long-term demands of high performance structures and provides versatility, efficiency and resiliency in the build. So precast concrete, it's anesthetically versatile. It can be made virtually in any colour, form and texture. It integrates well with facades and is compatible with existing structures. It is structurally versatile. It can be created in economical sections, integrates structurally and can create long, clear, prop-free spans. It is reusable also. It can be recyclable and it also can be reused after disassembly. Precast concrete is on-site, it is efficient. It, it has on-site efficiency insofar as it has minimal site disturbance, negligible waste. It creates accelerated construction can be manufactured um, off-site and um, is not affected by the weather. Just-in-time deliveries, which means there's less on-site clutter. Precast concrete is also energy and operationally efficient. It has thermal, it is thermally efficient and has long, long, low ongoing maintenance costs. There is also a reduction of risk because it has reduced trades and site personnel, which means hazards are reduced and that equates to increased profits. Precast concrete is also resilient. It is structurally durable. It has a long service life. It has enhanced durability properties and it has functional resilience. It is also multi-hazard protection. So it's storm resistant, earthquake resistant, blast resistant. And also it has health and safety qualities. It, it contains in, indoor environmental quality and also passive fire resistance. So the next, um, uh, the next uh, topic I'd like to talk about are the, are the typical components and systems found um, where precast is used. And these are broken down into four sectors in the construction industry. First one is infrastructure. And these are where, um, where we get the large elements of precast concrete. So within the um, infrastructure sector, precast can be found with using um, tunnel lining segments, um, the viaduct segments match cast, and these can be up to uh, over well over 100 tonne um, viaduct segments. Also pre-stressed bridge beams, which come in array, box beams, I beams, T beams, single and double, T roth beams, super T beams, U beams, and L beams. There's also uh, road deck slabs, bridge deck planks, parapets, noise walls, piers, columns, column capitals, headstocks and piles. And there's a few photos showing a U-beam up the top, the viaduct, 
viaduct match cast segments, double T's and column capitals. Also, also in the civil sector, we have um, wastewater systems where precast can be used in for detention tanks and septic tanks, absorption trenches and pits. Also, uh, precast uh, can be used in retaining walls, crib blocks, reinforced earth, cantilever and counterfort retaining walls. Also, pipes, curb and gutting, box culverts, head walls, burial crypts, and also marine structures. In the rail sector, um, there are um, we get pre-stressed sleepers. Um, track and switch bases, platform units, lift shafts, crossings, and also track side structures. Then we moving, move into the building sector. I've broken this up into architectural facades and also um, the structural uh, component. And first of all, in the architectural facades, um, solid wall panels. So these can come um, be created in off form using gray and off white cement. They can also be coloured using pigment in the concrete mix. Um, with exposed aggregates, um, we can expose aggregates by using acid etching, sandblasting, honing, polishing, and also uh, veneer facings. Um, we can also cast brick tiles into the surface of the panel. These are called brick slip panels. And then also 3D profiles um, using either rubber or concrete mould form liners. And these panels generally are non-load bearing cladding panels. Um, and also there is um, double wall panels. And these are two layers of thin con concrete connected with a steel lattice truss to create a cavity for installing additional reinforcement and concrete. And there we have some photos of a brick slip panel, quite effective. Um, and also the colored wall panels and the double wall, double wall panels showing the lattice in between the two thin, uh, thin skins of concrete. Um, also, in the actual facades, um, insulated sandwich wall panels. Now, these these panels are insulated with a thin layer of continuous polystyrene, which is cast between two skins of concrete to achieve the desired thermal R value. Um, external precast sandwich panels can help to significantly reduce the any cons energy consumption of a building. They also have excellent sound transmission properties. They are um, they. Internal and external applications, they can be found in external and internal applications. Various external finishes can be produced to the outside face of these panels. They can also be load bearing and non load bearing cladding panels. Um, services such as power, lighting, AV, and communications can be cast into the internal concrete skin, thus reducing the on ongoing trades cost and time. And they are also commonly used in um, correctional centres and student housing projects. And the third um, product in the architectural facades are GRS wall power cladding. So these are reinforced uh, with glass. Um, they create a visually stunning 3D shape. Um, what they are is a thin sectional facade system that is strengthened with a framework of steel that is fixed to the rear face of the panels. And there's a photograph showing the uh, framework um, fixed to the inside face of a, um, of a GRC panel. Um, glass fibers are cast into the concrete, uh, which increases tensile and flexural and impact strengths. And they have a very low self weight. And then in the building sector also is the structural components um, of which there are many type of um, uh, components that can be found with precast. Footings, uh, columns, beams, beam shells, solid floor planks, load bearing wall panels, um, lift and stair shafts, shear walls, stair flights and landings, stadium plats and raker, ba and raker beams. So as you can see this in those photos, um, we have beam and column combinations, uh, raker and plats for stadiums, we have uh, stairs and landings, um, and notice that the stands are, uh, stairs are supported by corbels off the uh, off the wall panels, and also we have lift shafts with full height um, flat grey panels or segment uh, segmental lift shafts. 
and uh, just a bit of a focus on the uh, precast flooring systems that are available. Um, hollow core, uh, pre-stressed extruded floor planks, which have a very efficient span depth ratio and low self weight. Um, and these particular planks are able to span up to 14, uh, sorry, 15 metres without temporary works. There is also trans floor available um, and also under the name of Austral Deck. And this is a thin layer of concrete biscuit with steel lattice, lattice trusses cast in to provide its strength. Ideal for clean, clean slab soffits. And thirdly, there's also ultra floor available. And these are pre-stressed extruded floor beams with infill FC sheets or bond deck. And these, uh, this particular system is ideal for residential and commercial loadings. So then we get into um, the next, which is design with precast. And I'm going through the basic fundamentals of designing with precast. So as introduction, precast should be integrated into a project's design at the preliminary concept stage. The important question, could we build this structure in precast, should be asked early in the project's life. Generally, it is difficult, expensive and time consuming to retrospectively incorporate precast into a structure after conventional in situ design documents have been issued. Once the decision has been determined to use precast in the build, there are some fundamental basic aspects that designers should include in the project scope in order to provide a cost effective precast solution. So I'll just go through the following details. First of all, repetition. And this is probably the most important aspect of designing with precast. Um, so an economical design would incorporate a significant number of identical precast elements. That is product with the same dimensions, reinforcement, concrete, finish, connection, connections, transport and installation requirements. Essentially, every mould change is money, so less mould alterations equates to reduced costs. There are also reduced costs associated with producing less shop drawings, uh, purchasing reinforcement and components due to the ability to buy in bulk, and there are also reduced costs uh, when it comes to loading trucks from the storage yard due to the double handling of the product being eliminated. So that photo there shows great product, great repetition with product. So with shop drawings, there are many sophisticated cat shop drawing packages available, AutoCAD, Revit, Tech, tech to name a few. So panel shop drawings should be drawn in 2D with clear and concise dimensions that are all measured off one set, set out point. Dimensions should not be accumulated. Where possible, stripping tapers should be detailed to order, to, in order to permanently fix shutters to tables or reuse uh, block out formers. Stripping tapers should be a minimum of one in 10. Minimize the number of shop drawings produced, produced by tabulating similar size panels on one drawing. That is if, if a width or a, or a length of a panel um, changes, then if there's many of these, we could um, create tab tables on, on a one shop drawing. Also lifting inserts as well as panel lifting arrangements should be included on all shop drawings. Um, reinforcement and pre-stressing strand set outs should be shown on the shop drawing if space permits. And also show types and extensive finishes on the shop drawing. So connections. So fixings and fittings should be simple to cast in the element and simple to install and finish on site. Remember the acronym KISS. Keep it seriously, seriously simple. So dowels and grout tubes should be designed for the base connections, clips and or angle brackets for the top restrained fixings. Design should be only, uh, only for two vertical support points, thus ensuring no redundancy due to long-term movement. High shear load transfer connections are achievable using panel to panel plates. Castellated cast, edge profiles and also double wall panels. Concrete corbels in lieu of steel, if they're going to be accommodated internally. Um, concrete corbels are fire rated, steel is not fire rated. Provide a minimum of four restraint connections for cladding panels, that is two top, two bottom. Two bottom. All connections should allow for adequate manufacturing, site, and erection tolerances. 
Oversized holes and washers should be standard practice throughout. Um, On-site welding should be kept to a minimum. It's very expensive to get boiler makers and also EWPs on site. So keep on-site welding to a minimum and maximise the use of standard should provide off-the-shelf off fittings. Joints. So joints should be standardised to be a nominal 20 mil width for both vertical and horizontal joints, except for of course expansion joints. 12 by 12 chamfers are typical for all edges. Butt joints, butt joints, a simple butt joint is the cheapest to produce. Um, check with the precaster for preferred dimensions of ship joints as they have shutters available that they've used in the past. Baffles should only be detailed with open drain joints as shown in the um, photograph there. And also generally, if joint requires to be fire rated, only detail fire rated corking internally. Non fire rated coloured corking can then be used externally. And there's a photo of a castellated shear transfer joint. Moulds. The fabrication of moulds is going to be capital cost for any precast project. Moulds are an essential part of the planning and manufacturing, so efficiencies can be achieved with good, good mould design. Steel moulds should be used for multiple pours. Timber moulds for small number of castings, less than five. Design the product that requires mould inserts, e.g. blockouts, um, rather than complete uh, and manufacture um, new complete moulds. So number of moulds will reflect the production schedules, which will be governed by the on-site delivery programs. It's vitally important then that realistic site time tables be established early so as to determine the required casting rates. Um, and remember that continuous daily pours would not be possible if moulds required to be changed. And again, with moulds, remember to provide generous stripping tapers. Reinforcement. So ideally, off-the-shelf mesh sheets should be utilised. Um, they're, they're cheap when it comes to reinforcing uh, wall panels. Um, Project-specific mesh sizes can be fabricated by specialist suppliers of water products, and there are specialists um, that make mesh up to the size of N16 bars. Um, the use of process bars, um, stirrups, cogs, hooks, should be kept to a minimum. But when pre-processed bars um, are used, bar shapes and sizes should be rationalised to maximise repetition. Uh, hot dip galvanising should not be used unless exposure or cover conditions govern. It's very expensive to hot dip uh, galvanised um, steel. Um, and also glass and steel fibre reinforcement can be used for thin sections such as glass reinforced concrete. Uh, seven, so the size of the elements. So over, overall dimensions of each unit should be maximised to reduce the per square metre rate or the per tonne manufacturing cost rate. Sizes are governed by the joint set out, architectural design, storage, transport, factory crane and on-site crane limitations. Options such as a larger crane on site should be assessed, assessed if there will be a proportional reduction with lift numbers and the subsequent shortening of the on-site program. Openings in wall panels should be designed completely encased within the element, what we deem as a donut panel, and vertical members should maximise height. Double and triple storey columns and wall panels should be considered. However, temporary works will be critical. And as you can see in those photos, uh, there is a super T beam, and I think that beam is 38 metres long. And also the bottom photo shows you a three-storey height wall panels. So it's quite achievable. Finishes. So a large variety of finishes are available in Australia and many precasts can, can offer a large selection. Um, costs vary greatly, um, off form being the cheapest and a high sheened polished uh, being the most expensive. And when there's um, uh, finishes with exposed coarse aggregates, then these aggregates can vary significantly from $75 a tonne for basalts to over $500 a tonne for granites and feldspars. 
check that savings can be realized if top surface panel in the mold requires less finishing. Um, so the design should be checked uh, for any internal aligning to the inside face of the panels in their final location. So that might mean that instead of providing a power float finish to the inside face, we'd get away with a wood float finish. And also rubber and concrete form liners can create highly defined 3D profiles. So a couple of photos showing the highly uh, high sheen polished finish to the top and also the form liner finish on the photo in the base, in the bottom of the page. Nine, okay, so temporary works. Um, and temporary works is, is, is a very important um, and overlooked at times um, sector in precast. So temporary works includes um, design of the product itself in all phases of handling. So that is the stripping, the lifting and rotating procedures. Um, this includes lifting inserts, lifting arrangements and rigging design. It also incorporates the design of strong backs and attachments for strength of the element during the handling. It also, it's the design of the product in storage uh, while the product's being transported and also while the panel's being supported uh, on site and also the construction applied, applied to the product itself. And secondly, the design of temporary support structures including um, lifting and spreader beams, they will have to be designed. Um, storage racks and frames, specifically designed frames for transport. Um, On-site support systems, that is the push pull braces, vertical propping, formwork and temporary fixings. Uh, it might be panel to panel, angle brackets or fish blades. Um, and finally, the construction loads, which are the wind, wet concrete, live loads, fixed external attachments, which might be it might be an awning that's attached to the precast, still in the temporary state. Um, the construction sequencing, if, if panels are in, uh, erected in sequence, and also a, a possible impact by mobile equipment running around the site. Okay, so then we move on to the sustainability topic. Um, so precast concrete has minimal influence on during construction. It does not require any on-site storage or staging, thus has a reduced on-site footprint. It has minimal on-site clutter, so that generally means that other trades can follow soon after, even the next day. It requires less labour on site, therefore requires less site facilities and reduces disruption to the surrounding areas. It does not require cutting or modification, thus the generation of dust and waste is reduced. Precast concrete has a high heat capacity due to its thermal mass, which means it can slowly absorb and store heat energy and likewise slowly release it when the temperature differential shifts. This helps reduce the heating and cooling peaks as well as, sh as shift away from the high energy demand peaks where it actually rates are more expensive. This also translates to less energy required to maintain a comfortable indoor temperature. Structures can be designed to be disassembled and reused in future product, products, projects. Sorry, um, precast is also an inert prop material um, and does not contribute to poor indoor air quality. And also, precast can provide a finished surface internally without linings, which reduces the overall costs, waste, and durability. So, what are precast manufacturers doing to provide a sustainable product? First of all, they use locally sourced materials. So that that um, translates into less travel time and also emissions. They also recycle water and reduce water content. Precast manufacturers can reduce cement requirements by lowering water cement ratios. They also use admixtures such as a hardening accelerators to eliminate applied heat for curing. Uh, precast manufacturers uh, are using large insulated self-heating enclosures for curing to achieve sufficient overnight strengths for lifting product next day. They also use self-compacting concrete, SCC concrete, for quick, quicker placement, no vibration, less noise and reduced surface defects. And um, they also use cementitious materials, SCMs, 
to supplement and reduce cement content. So by, by products of steel making, which is slagment and power generation, fly ash, are often used as substitutes for cement. And manufacturers recycle all scrap steel and reinforcement. So then we move into the case studies. Okay, so the first case study I want to look at is the Sydney Football Stadium redevelopment and park. Um, so the old Alliance Stadium was demolished and John Holland are presently building the new football stadium. So the project re review uh, overview of the project. Um, okay, from uh, it is a tier one world class stadium. It will have a seating capacity of 42,500 people plus. It has a gross building area of 118,000 square metres. Um, from a precast point of view, there are 878 precast pre-stressed double plats, 348 vomitry, stair and balustrade panels, 1,384 step units, 2,800 um, square metres of acid etched architectural cladding panels, 400 square metres of brick slit precast wall panels, 550 square metres of precast stair treads, 250 square metres of precast retaining wall, 180 square metres of austral deck, and there are box culverts, drainage pits and pipework. So as you can see, there is a very large extent of precast on this project. And there is a photo showing the upper tiers going up on the western side, and below is the SCG grandstands. So I'd just like to focus on the double plat design um, with this stadium. So the original design of the stadium incorporated 1,460 single plat plats to support the seating. Um, a concept was put forward to combine the single plats to create 878 double plat configuration. So transport limitations, crane capacities and side access, including approach routes were checked and they were all ticked off. And thus the design was amended to incorporate double plats. And just to highlight the savings achieved um, due to going to double plat, we have a 40% reduction in plat installation. So that, relate, that um, translates to um, time saved for the following trades to be engaged earlier. There are five and a half um, thousand lineal meters of jointing that were um, um, that were eliminated, 25% less reinforcement and pre-stressing strand used in the double plate configuration, and also 40% less fixings. So overall, it was a very successful um, project put forward from a precast point of view. A few photos now. Um, this is the uh, a reinforcement cage double plat assembly um, in the mould, and as you can see, there are uh, the strands projecting through the end shutters. There is the double plat storage yard. Now these plats were made um, upside down, so they were rotated. The precast actually rotated these to the upright position in his yard. They were delivered to site and there's the double plat being lifted on site. And notice the strands at the ends of the units. And there is a vomitory wall, uh, temporary based, and you can note the uh, corbels um, on the vomitory wall that support the plats. And also to the right, there is a precast stair unit. And there is the completed northern stand um, of the, um, on the, on the uh, stadium. And you can see that the plats are installed. We have the precast steps. We have the uh, vomitory walls and the back of bowl balustrades at the back. And you notice that every second joint on the plat is not caulked. It's a solid joint. And finally, these are the architectural um, podium panels. Um, the bottom half of these panels um, are uh, acid etched and the top half is off form. And as you can see, it's colored and there is a 3D profile in the off form section up the top. So these are going to be um, installed around the ground floor perimeter of the stadium. 
Then we move on to the Clarence Correctional Centre in Grafton. Uh, this was completed in uh, 2020, early on. And this is another build by John Holland. Um, it's a very, very large development site. So the total development site is 195 hectares. And what I've done is superimposed the site onto the CBD of Sydney and it stretches from the southern abutment of the Harbour Bridge right down to the southern end of Hyde Park. So it's 2.4 kilometres long by 1.1 kilometres wide. It, uh, it has a gross floor area of 93,000 square metres. There were 120, kil 120 kilometres of in-ground services and also there were 66,000 square metres of pavement put down. Um, that is the site. Um, there are 65 buildings all in precast um, with a grand total of beds of eight, 1,848 beds. The per perimeter is 3.15 kilometres long um, and they are also precast panels as well. There is a picture of the overall site. That is the male minimum compound. That is the male maximum compound. And the precast panel statistics. So there are 4,776 um, flat grey precast panels built for the buildings um, and they consisted of solid and insulated um, and the maximum waste, weight was 21.4 tonnes of those solid panels. Um, there was also 698 perimeter fence precast panels and they were cantilevered in design and the maximum weight of those was 16.2 tonnes and there are also the vol volumetric 3D cell units and there were 629 of those panels and there was 23 and the maximum weight was 23.8 tonnes with a total number of precast units of 6,103 units. Okay, a couple of photos of the 3D cell units. First of all, a photo of the, um, of the mould that's been stripped and that cell unit is just about to be lifted out of the mould. Um, the precast facility, um, we built it adjacent to the site. Um, this is the 3D cell uh, factory. Um, the reason being is just the transport logistics uh, for these units because they are very heavy units. Um, there is a reinforcement cage of the 3D cell unit and notice the casting services, um, the conduits and also the GPO that will be cast in. There is the storage yard of the 3D cell units. Um, and there is a closer view of the 3D cells, cell units in storage. Notice that the door frames are cast in as well as services as well. And there we have a 3D cell unit being installed on site using a 280 ton crawler crane. Um, there is a aerial shot of the precast um, precast wall panels being stored. So the external panels were insulated panels and the internal dividing walls were solid panels. Okay, so then we move on to our final topic, innovation and emerging trends with precast. So in Australia, the automation of precast factories is happening at a rapid pace. These plants have the potential of significantly reducing the cost of precast and make it more affordable to the construction industry. It involves the automation of reinforcement fabrication, the setting up of the mould components, the pouring of concrete, finishing and curing. And there is a fully automated um, plant. Just shows you how complex these plants can, can be. So also in Australia, um, more and more cast manufacturers are using, utilising the best self-compacting concrete or superflow concrete. It provides an excellent off-form surface finish and the shapes that can be created and the definition, the quality of the concrete surfaces are certainly outstanding. So there's some profile um, photographs of image, images that can be cast into the face of wall panels. 
and also just the off form uh, finish with self cut cockroach is excellent. So emerging trends with precast. Okay, so another emerging trend is the use of surface retarder via a custom made membrane that is placed on the casting table to create images with the external face of the precast panels. This type of facing is called graphic concrete. Virtually any pattern or image can be replicated in concrete to produce an amazing finish. So as you see in the bottom photo, we have photographs that are um, that are on a precast concrete panels and also um, a pattern that has been also cast into the face of precast panels. So then we turn our overseas and in the USA they're expanding with smart precast pavements. So with pre smart precast pavements, sensors are cast into elements to advise on traffic conditions, support autonomous vehicles, heat roadways to thaw ice and snow, record tyre wear and of course vehicle speeds. Also, also in Europe, thin photovoltaic cells are being cast into precast wall panels to collect solar energy. Manufacturers claim that if a typical medium high-rise building covered 60% of its facade with PV panels, up to 30% of the annual, building's annual energy requirements could be generated. Also in Germany, um, they're developing translucent precast panels. Um, embedded in the panels are light emitting fibres that transmit light from internal illumination through the concrete section to provide a light source to, to the external face to create a spectacular effect. And as you can see in that photo, the, the effect is quite spectacular. So finally, uh, with publications, um, there are, also, there are uh, publications that can be uh, referenced uh, with regards to precast panels. Obviously the Australian Standards 3600, the Concrete Structures Code, 3610, the Formwork Code, which provides tolerances and also um, the class of finish uh, with precast concrete. Um, 3850, uh, prefabric uh, prefabricated concrete elements. And also um, there is the Australian Code of Practice for precast tilt up and concrete elements in building condition. The Victorian WorkSafe, um, precast and tilt up buildings, and also the Australian precast handbook, precast concrete handbook. Um, and concrete uh, uh, associations and institutions. Um, the first one's National Precast Concrete Association of Australia, the MPCAA. And they provide some excellent reference materials with regards to precast. Um, there is also um, a, um, a membership available to individuals under the uh, under the professional scheme. There's also the Concrete Institute and the Cement and Concrete Association of Australia, which have uh, reference material on concrete technology. And finally, the Institute of Engineers Australia, which uh, provide um, webinars, seminars, um, and all a host of information about precast concrete. And finally, in conclusion, the future of precast concrete construction, I think it's a big thumbs up. Thank you for listening, and I hope you have enjoyed my webinar, and I'll hand back to Amanda for questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rob, for that great presentation. And it's now that time that you can get involved. Um, thank you to everybody who sent through some questions on registration. Um, if you do have a question, could you please put it in the YouTube chat box and your name, just your first name and where you are uh, watching from. Um, we might start with a question that we received on registration. And a big thank you for Stephen in Tasmania. And he's asking you, Rob, how is transporting problems for precast 
factored into construction costs at the initial design stages? Rob. Um, thanks, Stephen, for that question. Look, during the planning stages to use precast, um, all aspects of the product are assessed, reviewed and resolved prior to pouring of the first unit. Things like um, stripping, lifting, storage, transport and installation are all considered um, during the uh, initial planning phase. Um, for instance, a large precast element has to be, that has to be carted to site, then it would be reviewed at time at the time of tender and companies, transport companies uh, would be consulted um, prior to um, obviously uh, working out a price. Um, then I suppose the logistics of getting this product to site and installing it um, would be all, all sorted out at the time of tender and um, quite clearly stated in the tender documents. So the planning of, of um, awkward or large precast elements um, is certainly um, considered um, at time of tender and then uh, obviously if the precast wins the work then obviously it's um, it can be sorted out and the logistics sorted out during the um, planning and and um, manufacturing phase and finally the transport phase. Thanks Rob. Um, we've had a great question that's coming from Dinesh who's in Victoria. Good evening. Asking why aren't precast homes more common? Rob. <laughs> Thanks Dinesh. Look, this is a question that's often asked because people see precast being used in residential, in multi-storey residential, commercial infrastructure, and not so much in the individual housing um, sector. I suppose it gets down to the uniqueness um, of the owner of the house. Um, the thing is with precast, uh, to make precast economical, as I stated in the web webinar, Repetition is the key. Mass production of the same unit is the key. Um, I suppose, and generally when you you might be using, say, you know, maybe 15 to 18 panels in a standard precast home, um, if you're making um, one-off precast house, then obviously those 15, 18 panels would be very expensive to make. I think it gets down to um, the mass production of precast. Um, and to such an extent that you can buy off the shelf panels from precaster or precasters. And it boils down to uh, out there, there must be a clever designer. I've often thought about this, a clever, clever designer who can um, adapt a floor plan um, and obviously the facade of a house out of um, say 20 standard panels that can be mass produced. And out of those 20 panels, um, a footprint of say 50 combinations. Now, if somebody can come up with that sort of scenario, um, precast may well, may well and truly um, become a, um, a, a common product in, in the um, housing sector. Thanks, Rob. And we've talked a bit today about the demand and the advances of the innovation in precast being an upward trend. We've had an interesting um, uh, discussion from Marcus. Marcus is in Tasmania. Marcus is asking you, Rob, with the current supply blockage in the building sector, is this having an increase in the price of precast panel construction and timelines and timeframes? And do you think so this will have a negative impact on use? Great question. Yeah, thanks, Marcus. Look, um, I can't really comment about the supply of other products in the building industry, um, but certainly with precast, um, there are, it's a very, very competitive um, industry. There are many precasters out there that, that can um, produce um, all sorts of product. Um, and certainly uh, I, I'd imagine that in any state you would get half a dozen prices from reputable precasters on uh, on products. So um, certainly uh, because of the con competitive nature um, and there's many precasters, I think that um, there will always be um, a very keen price put in for, for precast on a particular project. Thanks, Rob. And tonight's webinar, we're talking about the future. And um, we've had a question come in from Hilton. And uh, Hilton's asking you, Rob, 
Can you please describe the types of current and possible future construction works where precast concrete will be used? Thanks, Hilton, for the question. Um, look, I think there's an opportunity um, in the pavement section, uh, a pavement sector. Um, roadways making out of precast concrete, um, they are quite, they're being used quite extensively in, um, in overseas. Um, we have some sophisticated designs um, for slab to slab connections. And I'd imagine that pavement elements as large as say 30, 35 square meters could be produced, transported and installed on site. Um, road authorities in the US are, are using pre-stressed and post-tensioning post pavement systems for to rehabilitate roadways and also to construct new roadways. I'm sure if anybody uh, has ever done a precast, um, I, I'm not quite sure if anybody's ever done a, a precast in situ costing, but it would certainly be a worthwhile exercise um, on price, but not only price, but also timing as well. Thanks, Rob. Thank you. And we've had a question, uh, good evening to Brad, who is asking if using high early strand concrete, can panels be lifted out of forms in hours? Thank you. Um, thanks, Brad. Look, um, the cycle time for, for normal precasters is lifting around about the 15 to 18 hours. Um, because basically, uh, a, generally a precaster would pour concrete um, around about lunchtime, midday on, on the day before. And then people would come in for a four or five o'clock shift, remove the, um, the covers or take them out of the ovens um, and then um, remove the shutters and then lift. So generally you're getting um, that sort of strength overnight. Um, using high early strength concrete, yes, it can be done. But um, the way that most precasters do is they, they cover them with um, with tarps and they apply heat. Or as I said before, a lot of precasters have self-heating, curing, curing ovens. Um, and those, the heat within the curing ovens, that's been developed by the heat of hydration. So there might be 15 to 20 panels in these curing ovens. And um, the ambient temperature with, within the curing oven is um, is generated from purely from the heat of hydration of concrete. Thus, um, next day you're getting strengths in the order of uh, high teens, low twenties, which would be sufficient to um, to lift panels uh, from the tables um, and um, move them and handle them into storage. Thanks, Rob. And, and staying in that technical vein, we've had a question from Ron, who's in Victoria, asking, can you show examples of dowel bar lengths and spacings and how they affect structural um, rigidity? Uh, thanks, Rob. Look, unfortunately, I can't show an example of a dowel bar length. Um, however, I can say that the actual length of dowel will depend on the type of loads that the structural engineer is designing to withstand. Generally, uh, with a lateral restraint fixing, uh, N20 dowels are common, uh, 600 long with an amendment of 300 into a footing and 300 projection into the, into the uh, grout tube. And generally a minimum of two dowels per panel. As I said, two dowels, two fixings, top and bottom, generally for, uh, for panels. Um, however, with a tension connection, in which the dowels are required to achieve capacity over their full development length, the number frequency and the size of the dowels uh, will depend on the forces induced. Remember that remember uh, the, con uh, the precast concrete is, is quite capable of withstanding high tensile and compression loads, such as forces that are developed or, or can be developed in shear walls and lift and stairwells. Thanks, thanks Rob. Thank you, thank you for that. Um, we have some great questions and we have a question that's come in from um, Zigang, who's in, based in WA, asking, can you explain if lifting during transport and installation is considered, um, is, sorry, considered, I'm sorry, I can't quite read the question, part of the design of large concrete structures? Will lifting slings cause potential damage to heavy and long concrete structures? Hopefully, Rob, you can work out the question from that. Yeah, yeah, Apologies. that's okay. 
Thank you very much for the question. Look, all lifting and rigging arrangements must be considered during the planning stages when designing with precast, irrespective of the size of the elements. Um, these, de these, these details should be designed and, suitably, uh, and certified by a suitably qualified temporary works engineer. Um, components such as lifting inserts, uh, lifting and spreader beams, um, rigging capacities, single, sling angles, and dynamic load factors should all be considered um, prior to any lifting of precast, whether it's been in the factory, in storage uh, for transport or on-site uh, installation as well. Thanks for that. Um, you mentioned in your presentation and also in the question time, you talked about pavements and we talked about residential, but Peter's just broadened the question out. Peter's in Victoria. Rob, could you please outline the advances that precast construction has taken in the residential and commercial sectors? Uh, excellent question, Pete. Um, Certainly, uh, the residential commercial sec sectors have become areas where the use of um, precast concrete is expanding. I think more and more um, architects and engineers are um, incorporating architectural load-bearing facades into the buildings, as well as the benefits of precast flooring, because of the of obviously because of the long, clutter-free, clear spans and the speed of construction that can be achieved with precast flooring. Um, Look, developers and planners certainly love precast because of the shorter construction programs, and uh, which which obviously equates to um, quicker quicker returns on their investments. Um, and because of the myriad of finishes that are available, um, that are available, the buildings have a, a unique. I think they certainly have a unique quality, um, with the added bonus that the facade um, has a low ongoing maintenance cost. So. It really is a win-win um, across the industry in 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 the um, high-rise residential and commercial um, sectors. Thanks, Rob. And moving on to some of the challenges, Michael in New South Wales. Uh, good evening, Michael is asking, what are the biggest challenges for precast in the future? How will sustainability be considered in the future? Thank you. I guess the biggest challenge is, Michael, thanks for the question anyway. Look, uh, I've, I've already covered the sustainable qu question in the webinar, so I won't go over that again. But I think the biggest challenge um, with, um, with the, in the precast industry um, is, is, is that sadly there are still some consultants that are reluctant to use precast, particularly in the structural side of, of things. Um, precast Flooring is used extensively overseas. It's quite phenomenal. It, it's you know uh, precast in Europe. Precast flooring in Europe is dominates probably 70% of the of the flooring in in some countries like Germany, for instance. Um, so it's quite extensive over there. Um, and yet precast floor, flooring is is still used sparingly within Australia. I think. Builders, project managers, and developers have to step up and realise the benefits of using precast and push the designers at, at the concept stages to adopt the precast approach to the build. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you, Rob. Um, Debbie in Victoria is asking you, Rob, you talked about innovation in your presentation. Debbie's asking, what is the next innovation in precast needed to keep its relevance in the construction industry? Great question. Yeah, great question, Deb. Thanks very much. Um, look, I think the next innov um, innovation that will dominate uh, the industry, throughout the industry, is the use of SCC concrete. Um, what it brings to precast is, is pretty amazing stuff. It can, it, can create, um, it can create really stunning shapes, sizes, and off-form finishes. Um, and particularly our form finishes. I mean, um, quite regularly, I know we have the classification, the classes of off form. Um, SEC concrete can really, you know, really bring up the um, the class of finish on for concrete itself. Um, it really, I think, it's something that that excites precasters in the in the future. Um, the other thing is, I think, um, from a um, from a facade point of view, is using graphic art, graphic 
uh, concrete. And that, that's the um, that's the use of using um, a mat, uh, a mat of uh, retarder on the face of the precast and then washing the uh, matrix away the next day to reveal a, a, an incredible um, image. So um, I think that sort of product um, can be used in iconic structures, uh, structures that really wish to make a statement. Um, so I think those two items there will really make an impact over the next few years. Thanks, Deb. Thanks, Rob. And Shane is asking you about pre, uh, precast grain silos, asking, are they possible without steel bands? <laughs> yes, thanks. Thanks, uh, Brad, was it? Was it Brad? Uh, Shane. Shane, sorry, Shane. I mean, um, look, <laughs> I suppose anything is possible. <laughs> but the problem with with these large structures is, is I think, the transport component. Um, we have to um, obviously we are governed by transport limitations um, and I think if we you know if we create a, um, a even segmental um, silos I think it would be sort of a very difficult thing to transport but you know it, it, I've got to leave it to the imagination there's, there's there, there could be ways of, of, of certainly doing things and m maybe Using segmental construction, similar to how they make um, they put in tunnel liners, so circular um, segments and um, obviously connections uh, in between these segments to create the um, the stability of, of the silo. So, look, I have, I have to say I've never done a um, I've never done a precast salt, um, silo, but that's not to say that it's not not impossible. So thanks, thanks, Shay. We're getting near the end of um, our question time, but um, we had a question, and it's from Matthew in Tasmania, is asking you, Rob, how widely is precast used in Australia? Ah, right. Yes, of course. Okay, the use of precast um, in in uh, sorry, I'm just okay, Matthew. Yes, the precast is used extensively. Through throughout um, Australia and New Zealand, um, there are many precasters companies located in every state of, of Australia, and they are capable of. Uh, sorry, they are able to offer a wide range of precast product, products. Um, just um, a great reference tool is certainly the um, the NPCAA, which is the National Precast Concrete of Association um, um, Association of Australia, and what on their website they actually have a um, um, a facility to uh, look at precasters in each state and also have a link to those precasters via a drop down box um, to um, to show you which what what sort of product these precasters make um, so I would uh, recommend um, going to the NPCAA website and um, Certainly, if you're after a particular product um, and you're in a state of Australia, then um, that that website will help you, and and um, you could head your uh, inquiries in the in the right. Thanks. Thanks. And as we know, as as time goes on, you know, buildings and architecture becomes. Um, more and more different, more sophisticated. We've had a question from Hilton that's quite intrigued me. He's asking you, Rob, is it more difficult or even possible to use precast elements for a circular shape building? Uh, thanks, Hilton. Look, <laughs> I've done, <laughs> um, I've done quite, quite a few projects with with circular balustrades um, and very tight radiuses. You know radius in in the order of maybe four or five meters radius um, certainly not impossible um, but they are difficult to make and that will, would be reflected in the pricing as well I mentioned the molds are very complex um, certainly um, it would be also um, circular product would also be um, governed by limitations um, and I'd imagine that um, there would be um, when you're transporting these these circular sections, 
temporary works um, during storage and transport would be something that's that's uh, critical as well. So done. I have done them in the past, um, Hilton, but um, <laughs> it's um, price-wise, um, it look, it will be reflected in the price. How <laughs> complex these things are. Well, thanks, thanks, Hilton. <laughs> And What's that? I said, what a lovely way to put it, <laughs> reflected yeah. in the price. Um, yeah. A final question, which is sort of more from be on behalf of Engineers Australia, as we, you know, tonight's title is the future of precast, um, the future of the sector. For young engineers, you know, starting out in their career, um, who are wanting to get involved in precast and this type of industry, what advice would you give to them, Rob? Um, <laughs> okay. Well, how I started out, I started out many, many, many years ago and I did civil engineering at a at University of New South Wales and I applied for a position at a precast yard in Western Sydney. Um, and um, yeah, it's been in my blood ever since. So look, um, I would say that if you're really interested in getting into precast, and I hope there are many people out there that are interested in precast, um, you've got to start from the ground floor. You've got to start from the bottom up. Um, and that is a young engineer um, who is keen, who is enthusiastic to, to learn about the product. Um, now, as I said, there's many, many publications out there that you could refer to. Um, but certainly um, to become intimately um, intimately know about the product, I think um, I think yes, and being employed by a precaster would be ideal for a young engineer starting out if they're if they're actually passionate about modular construction, offsite construction. So um, and I've been in it for well over forty years, so. <laughs> So it's in my blood, I'm afraid, Amanda. And, yeah. <laughs> I love it. Or well, maybe you could all find an amazing mentor like Rob. <laughs> Another thing. Yeah. So on that note, precast concrete in the blood. What a lovely way to, to end tonight's session. Um, unfortunately, that's all we have got time for today. And I'm sure you'll all join me in thanking Robert Aldridge for a fantastic presentation and giving up so much of his time so generously to do this tonight. Um, I'd also like to thank um, Austral Precast for making our webinar possible. Um, we always appreciate feedback, you know, what, what would you like to hear about in the future, what topics. So I really would encourage you to complete the short survey that is the link is in the description box below. So once again, on behalf of Rob and myself and Engineers Australia, thank you again for joining us and I look forward to seeing you at our next Thought Leaders series. Thank you and good evening.